So we continue um, with our next speakers, Martin and Nawel from Anapsis, and they will be speaking about password recovery mechanisms in HANA. So please welcome them. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. And also thank you for, to the Troopers organization for such an amazing conference. So as you know, <coughs> today we will be speaking about the SAP HANA security, specifically about the password recovery mechanism implemented for this platform. Our usual disclaimer. Some word, <coughs> sorry, about us. My name is Nahuel Sanchez. I've been working at Anapsis for the last six years as a security researcher. My main tasks are um, related with vulnerability research and consulting uh, things. Uh, my name is Martin Doinar. I've been working at Anapsis for the past year. And my main area of research is SAP HANA and web applications. <coughs> We decided <coughs> sorry, to have three different sections on today's talk. The first one is about uh, general things about password recovery systems. We'll be uh, seeing different uh, implementation alternatives, problems that developers could face when implementing this kind of uh, uh, systems, and some uh, mistakes that big companies uh, made implementing them. Later, we will talk specifically about bugs and vulnerabilities that we found in the SAP implementation and SAP HANA implementation of the password, this password recovery mechanism. And in the last part of the talk, Martin will be showing to you how different bugs uh, that we, we found could be changed to fully compromise the platform without any kind of authentication. So when we started our research, one question that we had was, why attack this kind of code or these functionalities? There are quite a lot of reasons, but for us, the most important are those. The first one is that it will be present in almost every modern system. You can think on online services, Google, Microsoft, Facebook. Also, you can think on your company. Maybe um, you have an enterprise system which also includes any, a way to allow users to create new accounts without uh, user interaction or at least to recover password of already created accounts. A good one is that there isn't any good default solution to, or guide to implement this. There is some uh, link in the OWAS project that uh, speaks about problems or, or challenges that developers could face implementing these kind of things, but there isn't any out of the box solution that could uh, uh, work at least uh, for, for every product. The third reason is the complexity of this code. We tend to see that these kind of things uh, from time to time are develop, developed by junior developers and seen just as a small part of a really complex application. What leads that having bugs in this code could lead to a full compromise of the platform, of the platform <laughs> as we will see that this kind of code performs really critical actions, such as creating accounts, changing passwords, deactivating accounts, and, and others as well. More or less, what, what I already said, these kind of functions, uh, these kind of functionalities in, in uh, enterprise software or in, in applications have a really uh, e high impact as they perform critical actions, changing passwords, uh, creating accounts, and so on. Of course, m most of the time, these functions are performed without authentication as the main purpose is creating new accounts. And one thing that is important is it's possible, or we have seen that there is a difference, and it's possible to configure or to develop these kind of systems uh, with the idea of having approval or not from, from administrators. Here we have some default uh, or the most common ways of uh, doing this, or what we have seen. The first one is plain text storage and, and retrieval of credentials. Obviously, it's a really big fail. You, you may uh, know why. The second one, and really common, is to have a, a password reset mechanism that resets user passwords to a random value. This could be a good idea. The, the important thing here to, to have in mind is how it's implemented. There was a, a bug a few years ago affecting PHP VB forums, the, uh, the common forums, that once an attacker resetted his password to a non-new and random value, he could predict every new password that was 
generated by the system, allowing him to, of course, uh, take over any account created. The third, the third reason, the third method, sorry, is the, the classic email reset link. Uh, this normally is uh, used a lot. And it, uh, the, the common uh, way of implementing it is including like a one use token or something like, something like that. The last and also really common is the security questions and answers. During account setup, a user picks some uh, questions and he has to put some answers. Uh, in the moment he, he wants to reset the password, uh, you already know how, how that works. Also, it's not a, a really good idea, as some Hollywood people can tell you. SCP HANA is using a combination of these two uh, options. Uh, we will see how, how it works in detail later. One thing that we wanted to, 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 sh to show and to, uh, also to, to explain to you is that it's not easy to create or to develop this kind of code. Uh, one can think that uh, junior de developers made mistakes or small companies, but here we have three different examples of really big companies or tech companies that are really, really important that, made, uh, some, uh, that had some bugs in their systems, in the, at least in their password recovery mechanisms. Here you, you can have the, the three different uh, links to, to check the details. For us, the most interesting was uh, affecting Google, uh, the, the part of Google related with Gmail, as it allowed users uh, an attacker to change some different and small bugs, such as across a scripting, across a request forgery, and others as well, to trick a user into, once he's resetting his password, uh, sending uh, the, the new password to, uh, to the attacker. So, what we found in the SAP HANA user self-service. Some introductory words for those that are not uh, used to SAP HANA. SAP HANA is an in-memory database. It's a really important product for SAP as it's the default database for all its new SAP NetWeaver installation. But also, it includes a web uh, development platform and web application server that allows SAP HANA developers to create new web applications in a language called XSJS. Now, uh, there, there will be more languages available, but at least uh, by default it's XSJS. And this allows them to rapidly prototype and design new web applications. Those applications run in a web application server that runs with the database. The user cell service, it's the default application that was created to allow HANA users to reset and to ask for new accounts. It was disabled by default, so companies wanting to use it should, should uh, had to, sorry, to, to enable it. It was uh, available by default with the SAP HANA installation. It was uh, possible to use it from SPS 9 until SPS 12. And what we found is that all the vulnerabilities that we found here were present on, uh, until SPS 12. So it was uh, possible for an attacker to use them uh, during uh, all, all this time. And what we found was that there were different kind of bugs from SQL injections, uh, user enumeration attacks that are really common in user uh, recovery mechanisms, but also uh, logic errors or design errors as well as we will, we will see. It was developed in this uh, proprietary language called XSJS that is kind of a JavaScript but server side. Here we have what the user uh, sees when tries to use this application. He can reset his password if he's, he has already an account <coughs> and also ask for a new account in the system. The account creation process could be configured to ask an administrator user for approval or not. That depends on, on the configuration. But how this application interacts with the data, as I, as I explained it, this is running in a web application server that uh, interacts with a, a database. We have our uh, US search, user search service front end that uh, in, the, in the back end uses uh, the SAP HANA database and to connect with them, it's needed a technical user. Uh, this is a special kind of user that cannot be used to log in interactively in the platform. That user includes a specific role that will allow it to, to modify or to create user. We will see the, the privileges later. And this 
both these two things are configured in this uh, SQL CC file uh, artifact that is kind of a configuration, a connection configuration file. So, as I explained, we need a database user. New users for uh, users or new accounts in the, uh, that are re required by new users are created at database level. That's an important thing to mention. And uh, because of that, the, the rights required by the application to properly work are uh, a little bit uh, high. I mean, uh, it, it will need the, to, to execute create user or alter user uh, SQL statements, and that means that it will have the privilege, uh, uh, user admin privilege to, to properly work. Some interesting design decision made by SAP was that there isn't any God or untouchable user. You, we have the system user, I think we'll be talking about that later, but any user having the proper rights to create other users or to modify the user can even modify the system user. That's important because we, later we will present an attack uh, abusing that. And of course, it's not possible to, res to ask a password reset for the system user. The application won't let you do that. A quick recap of how the registration or the password reset process works. Once the user clicks the link, for example, reset password, the web application uh, sends an email containing uh, a link with a token that it, it can be we use one time, and the user, uh, once the user uh, receives that email, uh, he has to complete some, some uh, the information such as a new password or the security answer, and that's uh, performed using a POST request. But what is happening at database level? Okay. Once the email uh, was sent, suppose that the user is asking for a new account, once the email containing the token was sent, the account is already created at, at database level. The only thing that it remains to, to be performed is to activate it. It's really important to understand that. Once the user asked for the account, besides if the administrator approved it or not, the account is already created, but deactivated. And it's also created with a random password. Oh, sorry. When the user uh, wants to receive the confirmation email, the email confirming his uh, own email, and has to complete, in the case of the registration process, has to uh, select a security question and put an answer. That also is stored in a, uh, in a predictable way for the attacker in the database. That's another thing that Martin will be explaining a little bit more detail later, but just keep that in mind. Security question, answer, and the token are all things stored in the database. So I'll show you some bugs that, that we found during our research, and Martin later will show another different bugs that could be used with this uh, also, with these uh, bugs, to make a full attack. The first one, as I explained it, is pretty basic, and almost we, we saw when doing this research that a lot of password recovery mechanisms were affected by this. Also, there is a lot of bug bounties that pay these kind of things. It's a user enumeration. I think I already all know that, that what's about. An attacker uh, abusing this, uh, this URL and sending a JSON like this one could know which accounts or username accounts are valid or, and which not based on the different error message that is shown by the web application, allowing him to, after that, for example, try to brute force an account. To fix this, SAP released an SAP security node. All, one thing that I didn't mention is that all bugs that we are showing today are uh, already patched by SAP, and there is a security node uh, fixing them. You should implement this security node, and if not possible, or you can update to, uh, uh, your system to these versions, you should only allow access to this application to trusted host or disable it if you're not using it anymore. The second bug is a little bit more interesting. As I explained it, you can configure your SAP HANA system to send emails to users, but also to administrators asking them to activate user accounts. Those uh, emails are uh, based on a template. We have the, the template here for the user and the administrator. As we can see, there are certain parts of the email that has to be completed on runtime or when the email is sent. 
and checking the code that created those emails, we found that the code used the header host without any kind of sanitization. And this uh, header is controlled by the attacker. What he can do is just to inject arbitrary content in the emails. This is a really good uh, attack vector, for example, to perform phishing attacks over the administrator user. We will see a demo of that uh, in a second. Here we have the, the attacker asking for a new account. What, we, what he will be doing is using Burp to capture the HTTP request from the application and allowing him to modify it. Here we have the, the request that is made, the first one. Now this request will, will be creating the, 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 the Ask the, will be uh, performing the action of creating an account, and what, he has, what he's doing is changing oh, oh, changing the host uh, the host here for something that he controls. He can put anything there. In this case, he will use a host that he already controls, and we will see what they, what's the email that the administrator receives. Here we have the email. Of course, if in a real attack, he will be more a little, or a little bit more subtle than this. So the administrator has to click that link to go to the login page of the SAP HANA system and activate the account or approve the account. What he had, what he, the attacker can do is just to create an, a fake login page. In this case, what he does is something like that. And after that, redirecting the administrator to the real one, to a real page, just to try to be as stable as possible. And the only thing that he, that he has to do is check for the result of the, of the process. So here we have the admin the username and the password for, for that user. It is an administrator user. So it's a really useful attack as he, he, the, the, the attacker will be uh, gaining access to an administrator as an SAP HANA administrator user. SAP released a security node to fix this and the other recommendations are the same. If you cannot apply the node or, or patch or update your system, try to restrict access to application or to disable it if you are not using it. The last attack that I will show you today, it's a blacklist bypass. The HANA user cell service allows uh, SAP, administrator, SAP HANA administrators to set up blacklist to avoid users of uh, accessing the application. One blacklist can uh, be based on IP addresses. And what we found was that the check is against what uh, it's uh, performed against the X forwarded for header. The attacker's IP address is uh, added to this header, and the attacker can't avoid that. But what he can do is to add garbage to this header until the array that is uh, used to, uh, to create the, the blacklist is full, and his IP won't be added to the to, uh, to array as it's not, it's not any space left. In this case, he, uh, allowing him to properly bypass the, the blacklist. Uh, do, doing some tests, we conclude that it's only needed uh, no more than 1,067 uh, characters to fully bypass a, a blacklist or this kind of blacklist. We'll see uh, uh, the last demo of this. And this attack, this attack is useful, as Martin will be showing another, uh, another full chain attack. But if suppose that this attacker is blacklisted, he could also use this one to bypass the, the protection. In this case, he's trying to request for an account, but he's, we will see that he's blacklisted. Blacklist, blacklist, 
here we have the error message. So again, he will be proxying his browser and modifying the request. In this case, it's sending to the repeater uh, capabilities. Here we have your IP is being forbidden from using this service, but we had has to done has to do sorry it's to add the header with a lot of garbage and in this case we have a 200 uh, 200 okay uh, error code here is his email the attacker's email and we have that his account was already created so now martin will continue with the with the rest and the most interesting part of the presentation Again, as a fix, we have a security node, a patch version, and the same uh, recommendation. If you can't apply the patch, restrict the access or deactivate the application. OK. So let's make a quick recap about the account registration process. First, a user will request for an account by providing a username and an email address. Next, the system will generate a token, a random hexadecimal token, and it will be sent to the email of the user. <coughs> With this token, he will then validate his new account by setting a new password and a new security question and answer. <coughs> Both the security question and answer are stored in a, an encrypted table called Secure Storage, as well as the token. <coughs> we will see this later. Uh, so when he sends the password and the security question answer, then the account is validated, and as we said, it's not activated yet, but the administrator, administrator needs to do it. <coughs> uh, two interesting things about this is that the token we generate when we register our account and when we forgot our password will be the same. So if we want, we could use the, uh, account, the token uh, generated when we forget our password to validate an account. And another thing that is, it will be useful is that an account can be validated even if it has already been validated. So we can set new password and new security question and answer for an account that already has a password and a security question and answer. <coughs> As we see here, uh, when the user tries to generate a new password by the forgot password feature, he will have to set uh, to provide a security answer. But if we use the token generated in the reset password to validate our account, we won't be needing to, to, set, to provide this security answer. In fact, we will be setting a new security answer. <coughs> OK. So what we'll be doing is uh, an example uh, using John trying to create a new account. So for this, John will first send a, uh, will try to register his account by providing the username and the email as we see here. This is pseudo code that will be executed in the, in the server. <coughs> so the first thing we see is that the, the user is created, as we said. And what is interesting about this, uh, this line is that it, do, it doesn't only create a new user, but it also validates that the username is a valid username. OK, it doesn't contain any special characters or spaces. Why? Well, because the prepare statement will try to create it. If it fails to create the, the new user, we will get an error saying we have an invalid username or it already exists. So here we, we have two, actually, two statements. One, creating the, the username and indirectly validating if it's correct. <coughs> The next, the next action will be creating uh, the token. As I said, it's a hexadecimal value. And when we create it, it will be something like this. OK. Next, we will be creating a value for that token as it's stored in the secure storage table. And the value is a JSON containing the username we provided to create. Uh, it's, interest, it's interesting to see that the username is a valid one. As we said, it has already been created. And also, when we store the, the token in this table, we will be setting 
a, a username for a, a key, so a token. So what we see here is that a token is as important as a credentials because with this token, we will be able to set new password for John. Finally, we send this token by email. <coughs> now, when the user receives the email, he will be able to set the new password and secure the question answer. By clicking save, he will be sending the post request we see here. The action is save password, uh, meaning the validation of the account. Uh, then a new password and a confirmation of that password. The token, which is the one received by email, is that hexadecimal value, which is associated with the username John. A security question, which is an ID, uh, associated with a hard-coded string, a question. And the security answer, which can be any string we want. <coughs> Uh, without spaces. If we enter any spaces in this string, they will be deleted. No, no error, but they will be deleted. So one important thing is that the security answer does not get validated. Um, by this I mean we can include any special character we want in the security answer. Even quotes or spaces, well, spaces will be deleted, but we can in include them, dots, anything we want. And also, that the secure token format is validated also. Uh, we know that the secure token should always be a hexadecimal value. But if we send any string we want, we won't get an error. We will just uh, get something saying the token does not exist. No error because this is not validated. <coughs> OK, so what happens when, when we send that post request? Well, first, the the server will try to retrieve, retrieve the, the username. And by this, it will use the key, the secure token that, that we provided, to get the JSON and then get the value of that JSON, which is this one, the, the username. Uh, next, we see that uh, we check if the, account, if the token value exists. If it doesn't, as I said, so if we provide, for example, uh, any string we want that doesn't exist in the keys, we will see an error saying the token does not exist. <coughs> but if it does exist, then the validation process uh, is considered to be started and the token is deleted. Okay, so here the value actually is value username. So the token is deleted. We already have in the token value the, the JSON, so we don't need the token anymore. Next, we will sanitize the password that was provided in the post request because, as we see, we'll be concatenating it in a query from, to the database. So we, need, we already analyzed the sanitize function and we consider it's not possible to inject anything in the password. So we will say secure to, or secure to concatenate password with, with the query. OK, uh, next, the, the username is retrieved. We saw that we have in value the JSON. We will get the username, which is what we care about. And uh, we will set it in the username. And then we will concatenate the alter user, username, password, and the password which was already sanitized. Uh, one thing you might notice is that the username is not being sanitized. So we might inject anything in there. Well, not because the username, as I said, must be validated because it was created. So we cannot contain any spaces, any special characters. So here it will be safe. <coughs> and finally, we will be creating the security question, the uh, security answer. Also, the security question, but it's not relevant for us, so I won't be explaining anything about it. The security answer key <coughs> is and this is important, is something we can predict because it's the username in uppercase and concatenate it with dot security underscore answer. Okay, as we see here, so our security answer uh, for John, the key, would be John dot security underscore answer, or in uppercase. <coughs> and the value is the string we provided. Finally, we save this. And, we, and you might notice that it's also the same table where we store the tokens. OK? 
Okay, so username. Okay, actually, it's, yeah. and we can predict it. <coughs> so, what is really important about this is that technically there is no difference between a token and a security answer. So, I would ask you, how do you differentiate between a token and a security answer, and how you know which one is a token? And you might say, okay, is the hexadecimal value? No, because the hexadecimal value is not checked. So, as it's not validated, we could send any string, including John dot security underscore answer. Then you could say, okay, is the one that contains the JSON? Yeah, but it's a stringify JSON. So you might think, okay, a string, a string. What can we do with this? Well, we can try to hijack an account using what we know. First, when John creates his account, he will try to validate it with a valid token which actually contains the as username, his, his username, which will be shown here. And then, when he sets his security answer, instead of setting any string he wants, he will set it as a JSON, as a stringified JSON. Okay? Here we see we escape the quotation, but it will be stored as a, as a JSON. So, now if we set this as a security answer, we cannot differentiate between a security answer and a token. Because as I said, the token is not, uh, we don't indicate that it's a token because of the key, as they are both strings. And now we cannot differentiate it because, because they both have a stringify JSON. <coughs> so, finally, we will be using, instead of a valid token, the security answer as a token. Okay, we can predict how the security token key will be, because it's John dot security underscore answer, so we'll be setting that as a token. And now, when we set a new password, instead of setting the password for our sample user or John, we'll be setting this user, this password for the victim's user, that we can control and inject any value we want. This way, being able to hijack any account in a, in a HANA database. So, as I said, it's a two-step attack. First, we inject a payload in the, in the table, and then we will use that payload to trigger the, the attack and set a new password. <coughs> okay, that's, that is really cool. We can hijack any account we want, but we ask ourselves, is there anything else we can do with this? So to answer this, we first need to introduce the system user. We already talked about the system user, but we need to talk more detail about it. First, it's the most powerful user in SAP HANA. <coughs> it is created by default, and it can gain privileges uh, via directions. So he can set his, himself privileges and roles, all the privileges and roles that he wants, allowing him to read and modify any record of the database, and also allowing him to read and modify uh, the source code of the web applications. So we would say that if an attacker can have control of the system user, he will be able to run actually any code he wants in a JavaScript code, including the S SAP HANA API. Uh, he will be able to run any code he wants, allowing him to fully compromise the SAP HANA database and system. But the problem here is, okay, we, we might say, let's hijack the system user. Well. That's not a good idea because it's deactivated. Or at least it's strongly recommended to be deactivated and that's true for most cases. So if we hijack the, the system user, we won't be able to do anything with it. <coughs> but let's talk about the, how the user self-service concatenates uh, SQL queries and how the username is being used. As we saw, the first action that the database does is create the user. So when we provide a username, this must be valid one. This cannot, be, this cannot contain any spaces, any special characters, so we cannot inject anything in, the, in a query. <coughs> As we see else, we will get an error or that exists or is invalid. And then any time in the user service that in the user cell service that the username is concatenated with anything, is not provided by the user. It's actually being retrieved from the JSON. So 
the, when they de probably when the developers uh, code this, they, th they thought, okay, it's a, actually a secure variable because the, the user is not providing it. And we know that if we are not, be, we are not concatenating data, you, data that is provided by the user, or we are concatenating sanitized data that we know it cannot inject anything, then this query might be secure. Okay, no problem should be there. But again, we know that we can control the username because when we inject a JSON, we could also inject, we, we, we were injecting only usernames that were valid and already existed in the system. But what if we inject something that does not exist or, or contains special characters? So when we inject a JSON, instead of setting a username that is valid and does exist, we will inject anything else. So let's say we inject spaces and any special characters, we will get an error, a database error, because uh, it will try to concatenate with this. But the idea is, okay, we want to activate the system, the system account, how we can do it? Well, we, we cannot inject spaces, so we will be using comments. And what we will be setting as username is system, comments, activate, comments or space, user, now. When concatenated with this, we will see the alter user system activate user now and comment the rest, allowing us to activate the system user. So when we inject this and send the request using the, as a token, the John security answer, we will be able to activate the system user. <coughs> so how the attack will work? Well, first, we will send a, a request asking for a new account. We will use the token to inject a SQL injection inside the JSON injection. When we trigger this, this attack by using the, as token the sample, the sample user, john.security underscore answer, we will activate the system user. And now we just need to hijack this system user using the same method as I already explained. We request for an account, or in, in the example we will see, we are not requesting for an account again because we can say we forgot our password and use that token to activate the, to validate the account, as I explained at the beginning. So we ask for, for an account, or well, for the new password. We use this token and set as a security answer the, use, the JSON with the username system. Finally, we use this token and set the new password. And now we have the system user activated and with a new password. So we'll try to do a lib demo. I think you got disconnected. Yeah, I got disconnected, so. Use the VPN. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I need to connect to the VPN. Just one second. Yeah. <laughs> it can face. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Shoulder surfing.
Mm. Okay, the idea was to show a live demo. We are having problems with our VPN. But fortunately, we already have a video. Okay, so first, what we do is check that the system user is actually deactivated and we don't know the password of the system user. Now, we'll, we will be requesting for an account using our test user. And we should receive a token or a validation link in our email address. Yeah, I have to advance. Advance. It's really slow. <laughs> okay, we got the email. And as we see, we have the token in the, in the link that is being sent. Now, we will try to validate this account, this just created account, setting a new password, confirming this password, and setting a security answer. Okay, we'll be using Burp to intercept the, the request so we can modify it there. Okay, we send to the repeater and we will drop the request because we don't want to use the token that allows us to validate the account. So, now we will inject something in the security answer and as I said, we'll be injecting the JSON containing the SQL injection. As you can see, it's just as the example I show in the slides. Username, uh, the time is a timestamp that says for how long the token is valid, which I said to 2020. Okay, so we have activated an our, our account and what has already been injected in the table is the, the security answer with the JSON. So now we just need to trigger it. For that, we will use as token the test user security answer. When we send this, we see a database error. This is actually that our attack was success, successful because after the alter user that we already saw, we have other queries like connect that will fail. So even though they, that, that query fails, we have already activated the system user. Okay. And now we will request for a, for a forgot password token. As I said, we can use that token uh, in the validation. This is just to make it easier. We could uh, ask for a new account and do the process again, but this is faster. We'll see that the system user was actually activated, so we, ca we don't see the deactivated anymore, and we can actually deactivate the user now. So we just need to hijack the account by setting a new password. Okay, we already received the email. No, we didn't. We will be receiving it. Okay, there is the reset password email and we will use the token. We will not be using the, the link because it will ask us to reset our password. We don't want to reset our password, we just need the token. So, this time we will use this token to inject a JSON containing as username the system. Username. Okay. Uh, we change the password because we are actually changing the password for our account. We are validating it again and setting new password and security question answer. Okay, so now we have the, the new token, the security answer token containing the JSON that corresponds to the system user. So now we will be using that token, the test user security answer again. And this time we will set the password, but not for our account, but for the system account. So, set test password zero. 
send it. And successful, our account is validated. It actually says activate, but it's validated. So now the system user must be activated and with the password we set. We will check this. Copy the password. And we have the system user activated and with the password we set. To fix this, sub, uh, SAP released a hot news security note, and we need to install it or uh, disable the user cell service. So final conclusions. Complexity, uh, complexity is the enemy. Uh, we already saw many ways of implementing a security a recovery mechanism, and we also see that many many applications use a combination of them instead of using one in a correct way. So this is not just, a, just an SAP problem, but it happens in many applications and important, and, uh, important companies. <coughs> also, the, the recovery feature impacts in critical data, and we should consider the recovery as important as a login or as any other authentication method, uh, authentication feature. And finally, we say stop concatenating secure queries. We don't need to, we have prepared statements, we can do it correctly. We, we already saw the code, we could do that code in a correct way, and there would be no secret injection. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. Questions? Thanks, guys, for some nice work. Um, I know that the USS, so the user self-service stuff, is not by default switched on, I think, or is it? And do you know how often it's being used in terms of a percentage of customers? Um, Any ID? Not, uh, I'm not pr pretty sure, but we found some uh, companies uh, with the system exposed online. It's not a lot of them, but at least we, we saw one case. Uh, for our customer, we, we don't we don't know. Okay. But, but it's not switched on by default. You have yeah, to activate it yourself? Or exactly. It you have to activate. It's it activate by default. It's, it's, in, it's in the system. It's not something that you have to install, but it's deactivated. Yeah. You have to explicitly activate it. It might help a little. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Okay, so I fully agree to prepare statements instead of concatenating some, but I want uh, to know, did SAP change anything? So, because to my best knowledge, the last time I looked at it, alter user was not preparable. Uh, at least, as far as I know, the code was fixed. Yes, in the last version, it was patched. Ah, okay. Yes, it, it was patched. Further questions? Thanks again. <laughs>